People versus Robles. Good afternoon. May it please the court, Melissa Swartz on behalf of the appellant. I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Yes. Before I get to the heart of the issue, I think it's important for me to address what probably crossed all of your minds. Three years ago, he completed his post-release supervision, and he's still asking for the relief that he's asking. And I think that's important to why we're looking at this issue, right? Because ultimately, it's his choice. If you take a look at the appellate division brief, the main brief, the pro se brief, he asked to, to vacate his guilty plea in those briefs. He understands the risks, and it's a choice he's made. And he's also asking us to dismiss the indictment. Correct. And I'll concede that the cases I, I cited to are misdemeanor cases. Uh, I'm not on entirely strong footing regarding that point. But what I will say to you is this is a C violent felony. It's not a misdemeanor. But I think you should also look at the sentence in deciding how seriousness it, it is in deciding whether or not you should dismiss. Flat two years with one and a half post-release supervision. Clearly, the people didn't think it was that serious are of a case. Are there collateral consequences from having a violent felony conviction, though? There are, and I, I, you know, unfortunately, Mr. Robles has seen one of those collateral consequences, and that is uh, having it enhance a subsequent case against you. So there's there's a reason why I think it should be dismissed, but I, I can see the point that. The cases I cited to are not directly on point. If you look at the record in this case, the fourth department did not have um, anything to say that they com could completely rule out the possibility that the suppression hearing didn't impact his, in, impact his decision. Uh, my it's, client said a lot seems, of things. It seems to me they're conflating, arguably, two parts of this test, right? I mean, one is the proof, but the second, you have to have some indication in the record that it didn't affect the plea. Exactly. And I take your argument to be the latter, right? Correct. They're saying, well, of course he's going to get convicted after trial, which, again, there's obviously some issues with the case. The, the entire case wasn't, isn't before this court, and it wasn't before county court, right? It hadn't actually been tried. The people were willing to give him an extremely cushy offer because there were some issues so with... So do you agree there's a difference between a verdict after a trial versus a plea in how you're reviewing things? Yes, and Grant is the perfect example, right? Grant, th this court said, rarely, if ever, would we ever you know, delve into why somebody pled guilty. And in Grant, he went through his entire trial. The people presented everything. Um, and it was his statement, right? I don't really know what all the other proof was against Mr. Grant, but he, this court found that they couldn't deem that harmless in why he decided to plead guilty. Uh, there's no precedent besides Lloyd from this court. Lloyd is the only one where this court has said, yeah, the, the erroneous uh, suppression ruling can be deemed harmless error. And Lloyd has a very distinguishing factor. Mr. Lloyd pled guilty before his suppression hearing, and then the court couldn't stick to the commitment, and he was able to withdraw. Then he had a suppression hearing, then he pled guilty. The record here is the majority was just incorrect in their analysis. They tried to say, hey, he's really guilty, so this couldn't have impacted it. I think the, the record's clear that it did impact him. Unless the court has any questions for me, I'm going to ask you to reverse. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. It's Brad Osler for the people. So tough one on terms of why isn't the argument that they conflated the two parts of the grant test uh, I, I, have merit? I don't think that the Fourth Department improperly applied the standard and I would I read it as you had a gun and we didn't suppress the gun so yes and I what play. I would not be standing here is suggesting that there would be a rule that if you have a case where there's a statement and physical evidence and the physical evidence is the critical aspect of the case that the statement just must be necessarily uh, harmless or it's just not important in the calculus but what we actually have here are a number of statements by the defendant over, multi over multiple appearances where I think he's clearly explaining that the suppression of the statements played no role in the calculus of his decision to plead guilty. And what are they? He, first of all, said, acknowledged that this was a very good deal that he felt compelled to take. But it might be a good deal because his statement got, didn't get suppressed. Well, I, I think that takes, respectfully, a little bit of a common sense view of this case out of it. Um, the statement but he lost the statement argument, and the statement's coming in, so now you've got the recovery of the weapon, and you've got a incriminating statement, 
And in light of that, this is a very good deal. Uh, it, well, sir, I, I think it's a very good deal in light of the physical evidence that was recovered, absent nothing else. It could also be a good deal because you don't want to risk a higher sentence. Certainly that's true. Um, and but isn't it important to, in, in, to know what contributed to his, what well, went into his decision to plead guilty? Yes, and how and can I, you say here, clearly, he, unless he articulated during the plea colloquy as to why he was pleading guilty, how could you say that he did not factor that in. Because I think he did explain why he you ultimately You think, pleaded. but do you know? Well, I, I will point you to the things that, that lead me to that conclusion, and that is across the three appearances prior to his guilty plea, and even at the, the second day, the continuation of the suppression hearing, the defendant's focus was uh, essentially solely on the idea that the police had fabricated or planted evidence. That's it. And that really only has to do with the physical evidence suppression or the reason for their approach uh, to begin with. It's well, it, but it could be that the statement is what convinces him that he can't argue it was planted. I, I, well, I, it, mm -hmm. it, keeping in mind that there's a statement also back at the police station afterwards where he, admit, he said something to the effect of, like, he got a gun off me or something like that, which is... Yeah, but once, there's a, once the, there's a suppressible, well, there's a question about attenuation also, and I think we, I don't remember the name, but we had a case recently like that, I think it was in one of the collection of those Bruin cases, where somebody pre-Miranda said something and then post-Miranda sort of reaffirmed it, but the idea generally was well, once he said it once, the cat's kind of out of the bag. Sure, and, and I, I recognize that, but the issues that he raised, I think, just don't speak to his statement. I mean, his, his strategy at trial, I think it was plainly telegraphed here, it was going to be to attack the credibility of the officers. And that's it. And it really his But it's easier was, to attack their credibility if you don't have the statement. You could go to trial, like the chief said, and, and you might arguably have a stronger case for planting as opposed to a statement's in that says, well, I got to do what I got to do or whatever it was he said here which is tying him to the physical evidence. It could be tying him also to the, the bottle of beer that was in his but, pocket. But isn't that the problem here? We're, we're saying could. I, I don't think in light of the, the way that the defense was focused uh, in the suppression hearing and, and then the defendant when he was pro se after the suppression hearing, the way he was um, so concerned about the physical evidence. I mean, there was just no mention whatsoever of the statement. But it seems that the Wells exception to Grant is a fairly narrow one, right? I mean, the general rule is it's not susceptible to this type of analysis unless you can show very clearly it didn't influence the decision to plead. And I think your arguments are reasonable, that it may have been this or it may have been that, but I'm having a hard time seeing how that meets the Wells well, between his focus on the physical evidence and the officer credibility, and then his, uh, his decision that the, um, uh, the plea deal was essentially too good to, to turn down, I, I think, I think that's, that's your proof. That is adequate proof here under Grant and all the other cases that, that deal with that to What demonstrate. about his inquiry about being able to uh, appeal? I, suppression. Absolutely, and I think that has to be viewed as entirely, again, focused on the physical evidence because it, it, just, it just doesn't matter. If this case is sent back, the people's case is no different and no worse off for, uh, for suppression of the, of the two somewhat innocuous statements, or at least debatable in terms of how inculpatory, inculpatory they are. It, there's just no difference. It, it's difficult to stand here and say, well, it, it, you know, I guess we don't know what his thought process is when we look at the balance of the evidence and it just doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, that's a pretty good legal analysis, but I'm assuming he's not an attorney. And, uh, you know, the baseline significance that you can take out of his interest in preserving his right to appeal the suppression is that the lack of suppression was, could, could, as we've been saying, could have been a motivating factor in his decision to take the plea. I, granted, he's not an attorney, and I suppose could it have played a role, I, I suppose theoretically, but... Isn't that I, the whole point of, I think, the Wells exception test is 
you can have is this quantum of evidence that is overwhelming. You have to have that, in fact. But you can't equate that with, well, what reasonable person would have taken this deal? You need specific evidence in the record to show that the suppression issue of the statement in this case didn't affect that decision. And again, I think the things that I've pointed to speak to that. But you seem to be arguing, well, if we go back, we still have the gun, and the gun's enough to convict. And I think, again, that's part one. Sure, but I, it, in light of what he otherwise focused on, um, you know, there was no concern anywhere I saw in the record about the statements he made to the officers on scene. Um, it, it, you know, it, and, and even as a, a lay individual, I don't think it's unreasonable to say that he can view the body of evidence and kind of come to the same conclusion that I might because it's, this is a particularly complex but case. But doesn't what you're trying to do here and asking us to do is to speculate, as Grant warned, was the difficulty? Not, well, I don't think the court is, it has to ent resort entirely to speculation when we do have some record in indication from the defendant, not even filtered through an attorney, but from him himself uh, as to what his concerns were with the case. And when it didn't extend to what he said to police, I think that's enough. And I would also just note that you know, some of the other decisions that this court has, has, um, has handed down where there's a lack of harmless error, there's the harmless error does not apply, the, you know, the statements might connect somebody to another co-defendant and thus via accomplice liability, or it might link somebody to um, uh, you know, the, the automobile where there an automobile presumption applies. They, some of that can get into a slightly more complex legal analysis, I suppose, but this is just so straightforward and where there's no indication that he had any concern about the statements. I think this actually does, in fact, meet the, the rare standard where this would apply. Thank you. Thank you. Very briefly, because I can read a room, and my dad always taught me not to bet against myself. Um, but if there's anybody that's on the fence on whether or not the majority erroneously applied grant, I think there's a mid-ground relief. Remit it back to county court and have Mr. Robles either say, yeah, I reaffirm my guilty plea, or I'd like to withdraw my guilty plea at that time, knowing the full scope of everything that's against him. I, I think that's a middle ground if there's anybody that's on the fence. Thank you. Thank you.